So I'm going to lean into now, you live, you learn. You live, you learn. The beautiful music of Alanis Morissette. Here's a picture of Alanis that we have. I've loved her music because I love rock and roll and I love spiritual concepts in music. And she does what I think is spiritual rock and roll. You heard divinity. You heard all sorts of words in just the songs we've played so far today. And not only that, I saw that she was doing a benefit concert a number of years ago for Agape. And I thought, she's one of us. <laughs> and so I delved more deeply into her music and discovered that I think that she is definitely a very spiritually centered person. I don't know if she still attends there or not, but I think that her music makes me really think more deeply and more profoundly about myself and about my journey. And so here are some concepts I want to start out with here. Nirvana. Enlightenment, heaven. These are concepts that a spiritual seeker might be familiar with because they tend to represent to us a place we're trying to get to spiritually. The notion in the Buddhist teachings that if we let go of attachments enough and if we practice the way of the Buddhist teachings that we will experience nirvana and be released from our karma and released from this world is a, a very powerful notion. Then the idea in many spiritual circles that if we just keep doing our spiritual work, we'll eventually be enlightened. And in many realms that if we live our life and we live it well, we'll end up in heaven. Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven manifest on earth many times. These things lead us, I think, at a subtle level to often believe that as a spiritual seeker, if I just do the right thing, I'm eventually going to get there. I don't exactly know where there is, but I'm going to get there, right? And then we have, along with that, education. The notion that we have, especially here in the United States, in the Western world, North America, and many other countries, school. The notion that as a, a being, we go to school and we move through various grades and lessons, and then we graduate and we're done, and years ago, we used to have these events called the Dimensions of Mind Symposiums. I bet many of you remember those. We had a number of speakers come at what used to be the Regency Hotel, and we would spend all day there listening to all of these powerful speakers. And one year, Joseph Chilton Pierce showed up. I had not heard of him before. He is most well known for having written the book Magical Child. He wrote a lot of story or books about children and eventually about consciousness, about raising children consciously. And he talked to us that day about something that I had no clue about. He said, did you realize that the educational system that was formed and fashioned here in the United States was all built on the same notions of the Industrial Revolution? It was the notion that we could create an end product by taking some material, creating a machine that we put that material in, and if we, if we engineer the machine correctly, that that which goes through it will come out and you'll get the same widget every single time. The same measurement, it'll perform the same. Unless there's something wrong inside the mechanism that needs to be fixed, pop, we'll get the same result. And so that notion was put into place when we said, as a country, let's create this system. They start here, and they go through, and they get in, and then, and then pop, out comes this perfectly educated little being. I don't think that's happened, do you? I think that might be flawed. Because he said at the time, Part of why it's flawed is diversity. A human being, a little being is diverse in their very nature, their life experience, their genetic makeup, their neurology, their, their neuro experience, their everything about them. So we can take pe little kids and put them through the same educational system and they're going to come out with completely different ideas and visions for themselves, things that they were more interested in than another. And not only that, what he said was one of the biggest flaws is that 
Education is wonderful and we need it. It's not that we don't need it, but I don't know if you noticed, but when I graduated from school, there's a lot of stuff they didn't tell me. Lost, they didn't tell me everything. I had to figure a lot of stuff out, even in my profession. That's the biggest complaint I hear from ministerial students. I bet Dr. Raz heard it too. I think he's here. We'd graduate them and then they'd say, they didn't teach me everything in ministerial school. And we don't. We can't. It's impossible. And so what we realize is that these things that we have revered, everything from our spiritual experience to our worldly experience kind of sets up a notion for us that we're on a journey that eventually we're going to graduate from. And so humans have even come up with some spiritual theories like the universe is a big school and you go through these lessons and when you get the lessons, you don't have to learn the lessons anymore and that there's, there are things like old souls and new souls and that I might be in fourth grade, but Simone is in eighth grade as far as our souls are concerned. And she's much more evolved than I am. And that we, we are on our way and that eventually we're going to graduate. And I think a lot of us feel, especially in life and our spiritual journey, one day I shall be complete. I shall be perfect. My life will be perfect. Everything will go perfectly. I will have arrived. If anyone's had that happen, please come tell me. I'd like to know. <laughs> I don't think that's how it happens. And I think one of the greatest challenges is what Alanis sings in this song. You live, you learn. You live, you learn. Life is a constant experience of living and learning and living and learning and living and learning. And just in case no one's told you this, I'm going to say it out loud. It's not going to stop. It's going to go on forever. It's going to go on for as long as we're alive. Yes, we may uh, accumulate some proficiencies. We may get to points where things become easier, where we learn the lessons quicker and faster. I don't believe that the universe is out there doling us lessons and saying, well, I'm going to make sure that you really get this today. I don't believe that our teaching supports the notion of a God who is specifically taking us through curriculum necessarily. For we believe that, that our evolution is always at hand and that we are always shifting and growing. Ernest Holmes says the evolution of the individual, the unfoldment of personality, the enlightenment of the soul, the illumination of the spirit can come only to the degree that we let life operate through us. Our founder is talking about that notion of being in concert in the dance with the infinite and knowing that there will always be opportunities and, and invitations into growth and evolution and that is being a full-on human being and being fully engaged in life and relationships and my experience in my body and all that comes with this beautiful thing called human existence. It will always include the invitations that are issued by our own soul, our own essence for evolutionary changes and growth and deepening. And that we are at a choice point to either resist that and be angry with ourselves. Because what I see happen sometimes is like a, a spiritual self-esteem issue. People think they know this, but then they're angry that I'm 80 years old. You think I would have figured this out by now, right? And I'm here to be the voice that says, you're never going to figure it out. Stop trying. Just stop trying. Just figure out to the degree you can right now what is being presented to you, the challenges that are in front of you, the things that are, are yours and yours alone and embrace them fully and lean into them and let yourself be evolved through your own soul's journey. That's the invitation with this today. You live, you learn. You love, you learn. You cry, you learn. You lose, you lose learn. You bleed, you learn. That's the invitation of this song. So there's some things that I invite us to do to anchor this in more powerfully and profoundly. The first one is stay curious. One of the things that we tend to lose 
as we get older at times or as we get more proficient in our living is that we lose the ability to be teachable. And we sometimes fall into the belief that it's safer and better and more impressive for us to be right than to be teachable. And so we lose the capacity to say, oh, something's happening in front of me. I don't really like it. Let me be curious about it. Brené Brown, the great author and teacher, speaks about this very poignantly in her book, Rising Strong. She says, choosing to be curious is choosing to be vulnerable because it requires us to surrender to uncertainty. It wasn't always a choice. We were born curious. But over time, we learned that curiosity, like vulnerability, can lead to hurt. As a result, we turn to self-protecting, choosing certainty over curiosity, armor over vulnerability, and knowing over learning. We can know that we might be struggling with this subject a little bit if there are parts of us that worship at the ground of some of those words. I need certainty. The more certain things are, the more secure I feel. I need to know what's going to happen and what's happening. The more I know, the more secure I feel. And it allows us to push curiosity away. Some of the most freeing words I find myself having to utter at times as a human being include, I don't know. Oh, it can be very hard. I don't know why this is happening. I don't know what to do. I don't know what that means. I don't know how to fix it. Those words can be challenging, and yet curiosity allows me to say, I don't know, but I'm really fascinated by it. I'm really curious about it. Stay curious, my friends. Sound familiar? Nobody got that one. I don't understand. Okay, you got it. All right, good, good, okay. Whew. So staying curious. Then it, we go into something that Brené points to, which is allowing ourselves to be embraced by the unknown. Buckminster Fuller said, the more we learn, the more we realize how little we know. And that is a place of opening in our consciousness. The more we learn, the more we realize how little we know. And so it's about letting go and of the need and the almost addiction to certainty. I would theorize and suggest today that no matter how certain you or I are or how certainly we create our lives, let's say we're somebody who does the exact same thing every day gets up and does the exact same thing every day, out of a desire for certainty and a control, and here's what I know is so, there's still way more uncertainty in that life than there is certainty. And in your life and my life, there is way more uncertainty than certainty no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing. Even if we do the same exact thing every day and show up to the same Starbucks with the same barista for the same coffee, who knows whether the beans will taste the same that day. They might be a little more sour or a little more bitter. Who knows who else will be in the Starbucks? We never know. There's always uncertainty afoot. And the human who makes friends with uncertainty will assure themselves a happier, more open life, and I think will usher in that energy that Holmes is talking about that allows us to evolve and to shift and to turn our lives around. And then the last thing we can do is allow challenge to be our teacher. I pointed to it a minute ago, but sometimes I think in this teaching, we think that if we're really practicing science of mind right, our life should not have any challenges. It should be perfect. Because then I've got good consciousness, I'm thinking positive thoughts. And I've even known people who, in the midst of their greatest challenges, don't want to show up to classes or to church or to their small group or to a group of people like this because I don't want to bring everybody down. They're so happy and positive there. I don't want to be so negative. 
And I want to say boldly and brightly out loud, if you're having one of those days, this is the place you need to be. If you're having one of those days, a group of people who can love you and see you and support you, that's where we want to be. We want to be surrounded and enfolded by other people who can see the truth of us and stand with us and support us. And that this church is a place where we are not expected to be perfect beings, perfect humans on the path of life. Otherwise, how in the world would I be here getting to speak to all you kind people? That just would not be the case. And so we all get a chance to walk our imperfect hearts home together, to support each other, to journey together, to walk the path of evolution together, and to support and stand with each other. The Tao, and uh, Lao Tzu says in the Tao, in the pursuit of learning every day, something is acquired. In the Tao, in the pursuit of Tao every day, something is dropped. And so learning, growing, evolving is about that dance. It's about the invitation to constantly be learning and growing and evolving and being kind and gentle with ourselves, understanding that if that's happening for us, we fall in what we call the realm of normal that we are normal, nothing is wrong, we are not broken, we are not defective, we are not dysfunctional, we are normal, evolving beings. Right now, I've got the honor of uh, digging into the book, Spiritual Economics, a little bit, and we did a book study in the store outside in the lobby on Thursday, and Butterworth says, occasionally, a student of truth will say, I have worked so very long and hard to develop understanding. How long do I have to work at it until I arrive at the place where it just automatically works for me? The thought is so understandable, yet so naive. He says, ask the great athlete or the concert pianist or the successful actor if they have arrived at the place where they need no further practice. They will tell you that the higher you climb in proficiency and public acceptance, the greater the need for practice. You will note that even Jesus went regularly up into the mountains to pray to practice the presence of God. He's talking about that notion that even if we are what we might call an expert in our field, we still need to learn and grow and have practice. Years ago in his book, Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell Gladwell talked about the, uh, the concept, the principle of expertise and theorized that if you've been doing something for 10,000 hours or more, you are then considered an expert at it. So some of us are expert worriers, for example. <laughs> We're doing it for 10,000 hours. But uh, it was interesting to note that his, his assertion was challenged a little bit. And if you dig into the, the research, actually 50 years ago, Herman Simon and William Chase suggested they were chess players. And they'd been playing. They were expert chess players. And they'd been playing for 10,000 to 50,000. And they asserted that to be an expert at something, you have to work that long and hard. But they also asserted you're still growing and learning. Researcher John Hayes looked at 76 classic composers and discovered that most of them, not all of them, did their finest work after after 10 years of doing what they were there to do. So expertise is a a challenge that even as, as we're hearing from Eric Butterworth, even the experts have lots of growth and work to do. By this definition, I added it up. I've been a minister now for uh, almost 33 years, and that would mean that if I worked in ministry at least six hours a week, I made it. <laughs> I'm an expert. I'm an expert. Yay! Woohoo! What does that get me? Nada. <laughs> Every day around here, there's still things that go on that I go, huh? What? Every week, there's new things to learn. There's new, there's new thresholds and new horizons that are afoot. No matter how expertise you, how much expertise you or I have at anything, we always must remain teachable, growable, open-minded, open-hearted, and to understand that a person who is growing is the person who is evolving. 
What if we have it wrong? We look out in the world and we think, well, the perfect people are the ones I need to be like. What if I need to be like the imperfect people? The people who don't always get it right. The people who make mistakes. But they're honest about it and vulnerable about it and are willing to share and are willing to grow through it. I think that's what it means to live, to learn, to evolve, to grow, to deepen. And that at the end of our lives, if we've done that, we will be happy. We will have said, I did good. I am good. And so as I close out today, I invite us to join together in prayer. And I'd like to read some words from John W. Gardner, who was the former Secretary of Health and Education and Welfare. It's from a speech that he gave when he was working in Lyndon Johnson's uh, cabinet. And I invite you just to go within with me, or if we have our practitioner prayer partners who'd like to stand with me as we do this prayer, that would be fine. I invite them to do that, and we just take a deep breath. Being open-minded to that learning, that growing opportunity that is right here, right now for us. Mr. Gardner says, the things you learn in maturity aren't simple things such as acquiring information and skills. You learn not to engage in self-destructive behavior. You learn not to burn your energy in anxiety. You discover how to manage your tensions. You learn that self-pity and resentment are among the most toxic of drugs. You find that the world loves talent but pays off on character. You come to understand that most people are neither for you nor against you. They're thinking about themselves. You learn that no matter how hard you try to please, some people in this world are not going to love you. A lesson that is at first troubling and then really quite relaxing. And so we relax into this, this reality of who we are. Indeed, what I accept and affirm is that the infinite light and life that God is has no capacity to abandon us no matter what we're going through. There's no ability for this universal presence to leave us, to desert us, any more than gravity can leave or desert us because it's unhappy with how we move about the planet. God, the infinite essence, is a, a principled presence that exists through us, in us, and as us. And it is always seeking for our journey in it, with it, and as it, of growing and evolving and allowing more of it to be expressed. Indeed, what if there's nothing to gain but only that which we need to let go of, such that more of the love and the light that God is as us may have its way in the world, in our life, in our relationships, in our bodies, in our hearts. And so this day, as we pray together, we are a yes for that reality. We say yes to that infinite light. We allow it to move through us. And we choose to recognize that the, the lessons, the journeys, the experiences that we have had that have taught us, that have deepened us, that have evolved us, are blessed moments that we can give thanks for. And the ones that we're currently in the midst of are blessed moments that we can give thanks for. And the ones that are yet to be are blessed moments that we can give thanks for. And we do right here and right now. For we know at the core of us, no matter what is going on, we are good, we are God, we are light, we are love, we are the fullness of the infinite in expression, no matter what. We give thanks for this recognition of truth that goes with us now and that has its way through us now as we release this prayer into that law that makes it so. We let it be, we let it go, and so it is. <laughs>